we're getting going now. Uh, let me let me introduce uh, Will uh, Vietch, who's the uh, from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Please go ahead, Will. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Richard, for the invitation here to be here today. My name is Will Veach, and I'm the lead for Climate Preparedness and Resilience at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So switching gears here a little bit from cybersecurity and now talking about a, a different sort of threat. And I think Richard invited me here because I'm going to give you a little bit of a different perspective than maybe what the rest of the workshop is about. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is not a science agency um, in the sense of NOAA or, or USGS, and, and we're not a, a grant-making institution really either, but we are a consumer of science. And so my goal here is to give you an idea of how we are approaching climate preparedness and resilience with the hopes that you can understand what we as the customer maybe um, do with science and what we need to push the envelope uh, to in further leverage the latest actionable science, but not go further than what science will allow either. Uh, and that, that will help you sort of shape your ideas and research and, um, and help us help you. So uh, my goal here is to talk for about 30 minutes and allow about 15 for questions. So by the end of this talk, you should understand the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Civil Works mission areas our policy when it comes to climate preparedness and resilience, what it is we actually mean when we talk about climate resilience, and how climate change really represents just one of many deep uncertainties that we deal with when we're planning projects. And then finally, some of the tools and the guidance that we use to help our uh, engineers and scientists who are working on projects to um, understand climate. And, and I've constrained it a little bit to talk about flood risk because otherwise I would be here all week. So I'll just use flood risk as sort of an illustrative example. Um, but there are many, many kinds of risks that, that could be uh, addressed here. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we're sort of a medium-sized agency. We have 35,000 employees. Um, we work all around the world. So, you know, we're smaller than GEICO, um, but larger than a university, probably, many universities anyway. Um, and we're sort of like two families living in one house. We have the military construction or military programs side. So they are constructing army bases or VA hospitals or schools in Afghanistan, you know, airfields. Um, and I'm not going to talk very much about that, but I'm happy to take questions about it if you like. There's the other side of the house, which is the civil works side of the house. And it's a little bit of an interesting history of how the Army came to be involved in this. In most other countries, I think you would have a Ministry of Water or a Ministry of the Environment. But we have become the nation's engineering and construction company, particularly when it comes to water resources projects. And Congress has given us authority to address eight what we call business lines or mission areas. So these are things like navigation. We have over 900 uh, harbors. We have hydropower. We're the nation's largest generator of hydropower. Um, flood risk management, uh, ecosystem restoration, water supply. We have regulatory authority under the Clean Water Act and the Rivers and Harbors Act. Um, recreation, there's actually more visitors to core lakes than there are to national parks. Um, and then disaster response. And so the thing about these eight business lines is they are all somehow related to water. And that makes the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers fundamentally, on the civil works side anyway, a water resources agency. It also makes us uniquely vulnerable to climate change. Because as the Earth's climate warms and we get another degree or two of, of temperature, it's really not the temperature that affects most people. It's really the hydrologic cycle that mediates most of the impacts. So it's the floods, the droughts, um, the uh, erosion and, and uh, runoff and so forth that really affects most people. And every one of these business lines somehow or another relates to water. So this is why we are uh, so concerned about climate change. Now, there's two general categories of action that I think we can take when it comes to addressing climate change. One is mitigation. So that's our uh, sustainability program, working very hard to make us use less energy, use less water, and make less of a contribution to climate change so that it doesn't change so fast. That is very important. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. The program that I run is all about getting ready for it. So this is the preparedness and resilience part. And whereas climate mitigation is all about carbon, methane, um, NOx, and other greenhouse gases, adaptation is primarily about water. 
and the water cycle and getting ready for those changes in the water cycle. Uh, we do also talk about heat waves, we do talk about wildfire, but most of the climate impacts we're concerned about are water related. And here's a little bit of an older graph, but I think it's still helpful, explains why both adaptation and mitigation are, are equally critical. So in this case, we're just using the example of sea level rise, but you could think of any other climate impact you like. The gold line there at the bottom of the graph imagines that we as a society, as a, as a species, take dramatic action very, very soon to reduce our CO2 emissions. By the way, we're not gonna do that, but let's just imagine <laughs> that, that we're going to happen. And so in the next 100 years or so, let's say that CO2 emissions peak and drop down very rapidly and they stay down uh, following the gold line. Well, the next line up from that is the purple line. So that's the CO2 concentration. And you notice that it continues to increase even though the emissions rate is decreasing. So that does not stop increasing until the emissions rate gets down and stays down. So even though we have peaked our emissions in 100 years, we still have CO2 accumulating for say 300 years. The next line, the red line is temperature. There's of course lags in the climate cycle such that the temperature continues rising for centuries after the CO2 stops rising. The solid blue line is the sea level rise you get due to thermal expansion of water. It takes a very long time for all of that heat to get mixed through the ocean. So even though we've stopped raising the temperature, the sea level keeps going up for, for centuries. And then the dotted line is the sea level rise due to ice melting. Take Greenland out of the freezer, put it in the fridge, it does not instantly melt. It takes many thousands of years to reach a new equilibrium. And so what you have is the climate is continuing to change for thousands of years, even though the emissions have stopped in the very near term. So if you think about climate mitigation, we can call that avoiding the unmanageable, taking action now to avoid the impacts that we cannot stand. And then that would make adaptation managing the unavoidable. There's very little we can do at this point to, to address the emissions of the past, so we have to get ready. Now we do have a long history in this. Um, the Corps of Engineers started working in this climate space, I think back in 1950, the International Geophysical Year, when we started drilling ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. And by the way, we're still doing that. So that is actually an ongoing activity since 1950. Um, in the 1970s, we were tasked to lead a White House Commission on Drought. In 1986, we got our first guidance on sea level uh, when planning coastal projects. 1990s, we revised our planning guidance notebook to reflect climate change. Um, in the 2000s, we've, we were updating policies, uh, including more advanced sea level change guidance. And then into the 2010s, and now in the 2020s, we're uh, recognized as one of the leaders, I would say, in the interagency in this space. I would also give credit to NOAA and NASA and um, the Federal Highways Administration, the Department of Transportation, um, also being among those leaders. But as an implementer of infrastructure, I think it's very uh, critical that we do consider climate change in a way that maybe doesn't affect um, some other, say, regulatory agencies or uh, Department of Justice, you know, um, maybe, they'd be, they'd maybe more just concerned about their own buildings. But we have a policy here, and I won't read the full policy. It's only about a page and a half. If you're curious, you can get it off of our webpage. But just a couple of highlights here from the policy. It says that um, we integrate climate change preparedness and resilience into all of our activities. So that's missions, operations, programs, projects. And for the purpose of enhancing community resilience with our water resources projects and ensuring the effectiveness of the military mission. And this is key because the, the goal here is not resilient infrastructure. Resilient infrastructure is a means to an end. The goal is resilient communities, resilient ecosystems, resilient economies. You know, this infrastructure is here for some purpose. Um, we don't just build dams because it's fun. You know, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to serve some purpose here. And we do this using the best available and actionable climate science. And I think this might be one point that this group would be particularly interested in. Because other agencies maybe have a different standard. They might use the latest available science. But we really rely on this idea of actionable science, which means uh, salient, credible, legitimate, and co-produced. And the reason we do that is that because we're implementing infrastructure, and the infrastructure can be there for 100 years or more, and it might take us 20 years just to build it, we can't react to the latest paper that just came out in nature or science. You know, we can't just be changing our policy this week because of the paper that just came out and then changing it again the week after. So we, we get accused sometimes of being slow or, or being anti-science, and I really don't think that's correct. I think that we are intentionally deliberate, and I think that we rely on science that we feel is very well vetted in the, through the peer review process in the scientific community can be reproduced. And that comes from the fact that our goal here is to design and construct 
uh, projects that are going to be there for the long term. And that may not be the case if you're an agency that's just trying to save the whales, you know, or trying to keep people out of the floodplain. I think there are different strokes for different folks, and I would never tell another agency that their standard is, is incorrect. Um, I think it's just all about fitness for purpose. And then the, we will consider that actionable science at every step in the project life cycle. So again, starting with, with design, or starting with planning, I mean, all the way through design, operations, maintenance, uh, rehabilitation, and divestment, we're gonna continue uh, considering climate change um, all the way through. We do have a climate action plan. This was required by Executive Order 14008, and it has five steps. Um, modernizing our programs and policies means changing the way we do what we do, so um, changing the way we plan and design. Um, number two, managing our lands and waters. We are the stewards of quite a lot of lands and waters uh, because we have so many lakes and reservoirs. We have floodways and, and lands that we manage when they're not underwater. Um, and we can manage them for both adaptation and resilience which I think is key. Number three is enabling the state, local, and tribal government preparedness. When we do projects, we do it in partnership with local sponsors or non-federal interests. So that could be a port authority, state agency, municipality. And so it doesn't do us a whole lot of good to turn over a project that's adaptable to an institution that doesn't have adaptive capacity. So we wanna be sure we're helping to enable that capacity uh, through those um, capacity building programs that help our partners do their own uh, preparedness. And then number four is providing actionable information. Again, we're not a science agency, but we do produce some guidance and some tools for our own teams to use. And as long as they were doing that, it's your tax dollars at work. So nothing we do is top secret. We make most of that stuff uh, publicly available. And then number five is planning for disruptions. So we just heard about a cybersecurity disruption, but certainly our own offices, our own projects can be disrupted by heat or fire or flood. And so we're preparing for those disruptions as well. So great, we've got a policy, we've got a plan, but what is actually uh, adaptation and resilience, what do they mean? Well, I got these definitions from Executive Order 13653, which was issued by Obama, rescinded by Trump, unrescinded by Biden. So I'm not even sure what the stat status of this executive order is, but I think that the information is still correct. Um, and it says adaptation is adjustment in natural human systems to anticipate or respond to a changing environment to use opportunities and reduce negative effects. So the point is that's a verb. Um, it's an action, it's a thing that we can do. And there's an example there on the right from uh, Marlene Hosnode at Deltaris that illustrates the idea of adaptation pathways. So in this case, she's talking about the Netherlands and their coastal uh, defenses. And you can see there's kind of this subway diagram where you can take the orange line uh, for as long as that works, and then you hit a tripping point and you need to change to some different subway line. So are you gonna do retreat? Are you gonna add some height to your levees? Are you going to add pumps? Um, there could be any number of things, but you've got a choice. Um, do you wanna get on the, the other orange, I guess? I mean, we're going from yellow to orange, or do you wanna get on the red? And so you have this pathways um, uh, approach, and that's sort of a, a really good way to think about adaptation. And then resilience is not an action, it's a trait or an attribute. So that's the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions um, to withstand and respond to and recover from disruptions. So if your um, therapist is talking about resilience, they mean something different. Or if you're a you know, public health official and you're thinking about resilience, you mean something different. But what we're talking about here is prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. So make our projects able to withstand disruption without damage, if they take damage, make them easy to fix. So we reduce repair costs, reduce downtime, get them back into service. Um, and if we do it right, take the opportunity to adapt them so they can actually bounce back better than when they started. So this is how it works. And I stole this uh, plot from UK Environment, um, whom we partner with sometimes. But if you think about an indicator, like let's say sea level rise or flood risk, you monitor that change over time. At some particular point, you review the situation, you project forward uh, a range of conditions, and then you establish what is the, the uh, un intolerable level um, that we can't accept, and then you can project a timing uncertainty when that's gonna happen. And then crucially, you need to back into when the time is to take action. You can't wait until everything is unacceptable before you take action. You need time to plan, design, and fund the action that we're gonna take. So that gives you the lead time and that tell you, tells you when it's time to, to, to adapt something. So here's an easy example. Um, probably the first and the biggest uh, change that impacts Corps of Engineers projects is sea level change. We're doing a lot of large coastal projects right now. 
from coastal Texas, Miami Back Bays, uh, City of Norfolk, New York, New Jersey, Harbor and Tributaries. Maybe you've heard of some of these projects. And of course, they're all on the coast and all affected by sea level rise. Well, the good thing about sea level rise is it mostly just goes up. So there's not really any uncertainty about whether it's happening or what direction it's going. It's really just a question of how fast. So this actually makes it, in some ways, the easiest of the climate changes to deal with. There's a pretty strong scientific consensus that sea level is going to be something between 0.2 to 2 meters higher uh, in 2100 than it was in 1992, which is the official sea level we're dealing with right now. Um, that's still kind of a large range, but it's not really all that large compared to some other climate changes. So what we've done is we've taken that consensus and we've backed into some polynomials and given ourselves three scenarios of future sea level that we require our coastal project teams to ensure that the project is prepared to perform under all of these scenarios. So we don't say if any of them is more likely than the other. We just say if you're building a seawall or you're building a port, make sure that it's going to perform under low, medium and high. So again, of course, the actual sea level is not going to follow any of these three smooth curves. That's not how sea level works. Um, but we think, uh, or at least we say by policy, that uh, the sea level will be somewhere between the blue line and the red line. Now, if you consider that uncertainty at some future year, say 2100, then you might say, what am I supposed to do here? I'm trying to design this wall, and sea level could be a foot or it could be five feet. And here we're looking at the example for Washington, D.C., where we're located right now. And what happens is teams looking at this kind of get analysis paralysis. They sort of don't know how to design something with this uncertainty. So what we do instead is we rotate the question 90 degrees. And we say, let's establish some critical elevation that would be a problem if sea level, or when sea level, I mean, rises to that level. So in this case, let's just imagine one foot would be an issue. And this would create some vulnerability for the project. Well, if we just rotate the problem and say, what is the timing uncertainty for when that happens, then we can uh, institute those adaptation pathways that I talked about. So we can say, when we reach this level, we're going to add height to this levee, or when we reach this level, we're going to put a, a breakwater in front of this levee. And that way, we can set that up and put it into the authorized project so that when it happens, we're ready to go. And we call this when, not if. So this is a fairly simple, or at least relatively simpler, kind of a, a climate change impact. But if we talk about riverine flood risk, it becomes much more maddeningly complicated. And this is because unlike sea level, there is no scientific consensus really about um, even the directionality, much less the magnitude of riverine flood risk change. And you could have a different change for the 100-year flood than the 1,000-year flood or the 20-year flood or what have you. And this comes from the fact that there's a whole chain of processes uh, when it comes to projecting future stream flow. So first of all, we don't know how much carbon people are going to emit, where you need to choose an emission scenario. Then you might have any number of choices of, of global climate model or a system model that you prefer. So maybe you've got 32 different models or, or, or 35 different models, depending on what you want to do. So you're going to get 35 different answers times two scenarios, let's say. And then you have to downscale those, method, those models. I mean, the native resolution of these global climate models is like four pixels for California. So that's not going to work for a project. We need to downscale it. Well, you've got choices of what your downscaling method is. What's your bias correction method? What, you take that temperature and precip, you put it into a hydrologic model. Now you've got to choose a hydrologic model. How do you want to parameterize it? What's the um, calibration data set? Um, and then you have to take that runoff and route it in the hydraulic model. So you just can see how every step of this chain multiplies the subjectivities so that you get an ever larger expanding tree of possible outputs. And what you get at the end is this sort of enormous spread of spaghetti that's very difficult to use for decision making. Now, if anyone in the audience disagrees with me, I'd be very interested. Um, please tell me after the talk or, or in the questions if I've got this wrong, because if we can predict the future, um, that would be really, really great. Um, but at least from what we're hearing from our scientific partners is we really can't, um, at least not yet. And, and I'll just say that maybe 10 years ago, we were hopeful that by now we would be able to predict the future, that the uncertainty in that spaghetti would have been constrained by now to a point where we could have more confident projections of future stream flow. But it seems to me that it's kind of like nuclear fusion, where every 10 years it's still 10 years off. And so instead of the uncertainty getting smaller, the actual apparent uncertainty has gotten larger because the scientific uh, the capacity to ask more interesting questions has increased. So even as the models have gotten better, instead of answering the question from 10 years ago more precisely, what they've done is they've asked more interesting questions. Like, uh, what happens if the 
the permafrost uh, dries out and catches fire and then there's black carbon on the, on the ice and now the albedo is different. We could never have answered that question 10 years ago so we didn't bother asking. Well now that we can, we just have ever larger apparent uncertainty, which is fine. We're revealing uncertainty, that's okay. Um, but I think we have to get used to the fact, the idea that we may never get there. Um, but again, someone correct me please if this is your area of research and I've got that all wrong. Um, at the same time, nuclear fusion would be awesome. So I, I still want to support that research. You know, I still want us to try to narrow down that uncertainty because if we can get it, that would be great. But we also need other ways of making decisions that don't rely on that kind of forecasting. So here's an example. We made this tool called the Climate Hydrology Assessment Tool and I've, I've applied it here for our location where we're, where we're at. So this is on the, on the Potomac River and we've got 32 global climate models and two emission scenarios and we have uh, downscaled that using, this is from CMIP5, uh, we've downscaled it using LOCA, locally constructed analogs, we've taken that temperature and precip, put it through a hydrology model, bias corrected and so forth, um, and then routed it. And what you get is that spread of, of projections in the future. So um, it doesn't seem like the models are giving you any sort of clear uh, trend in the, in the projections, but again, the important thing is to see that incredible variance from 5,000 cubic feet per second up to 30,000 or so. Um, this is why it can be very hard to put that into the economic model and say, what is the future gonna look like? What we can do though, this doesn't mean we can't do anything. So what we've done is, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get to what we've done. But um, I wanted to kind of explain, and I probably should have put this in a different order, but here we go. Um, I wanted to explain sort of why we take a scenario approach. Um, and the reason is um, there's sort of a continuum of, of uncertainties, and, and this is gonna tie together. So there's a continuum of uncertainty from on the right, um, total ignorance, where we don't know anything, but at least we know that we don't know anything. And then on the left, you would have sort of a, a single forecast, a single projection of future conditions with a plus minus for uncertainty on it. So it would be great if we could get that single, um, that single projection of likely future conditions with the plus minus of uncertainty on it. But for now, it doesn't seem like we can have that. So a, a level two up from there would be um, alternate futures, but with probabilities associated with them. A level three would be um, alternate futures, but with rankings, so a, a more likely and a less likely future. And then level four would be uh, like, uh, futures that are all plausible, but we can't even rank them. And, and it seems that might, for now, we're mostly in the level four, level five area. So we have either multiple scenarios, but we can't even rank them by relative likelihood, or total ignorance, but at least we know we have total ignorance. So, you know, going back to this, this projection here, we have a range of, of possible outputs from the model, um, but without even the ability to say which of these is any more likely than the rest. And so that is still a kind of information, and we can still use that information for decision making. And the way we can use it uh, comes down to this guidance document uh, that we put out a, a couple of years back, where we have uh, essentially a four-step process that we want teams to follow. So what teams can do is um, first of all, start with a literature review, and we don't ask them to just go to Web of Science or, or ResearchGate or uh, you know, Google Scholar. We, we, we have synthesized that research down into, into a number of reports um, to get them started. But starting with the literature review, looking at what the climate science is saying for their project area, um, both for the observations and the projections, and then secondly, looking at the trends in the observed data. So we have a tool called the Time Series Toolbox, which applies a whole battery of statistical tests um, if you have any observed rainfall or stream flow or what have you, um, you can see are there trends, are there change points, are there break points um, in that that would indicate something is changing over time. Number three is investigating the, the trends in the projections. So that's what I just showed you in the last slide with the climate hydrology assessment tool. Um, and what is the directionality of that change? Because these modeled outputs are not going to be correct in, in the forecasting sense, but they can give you an apples to apples comparison of simulated future against simulated past. So what are the directionalities of the change and what would that change mean for my project? How vulnerable um, is my project to that kind of a change? And that gets us to the vulnerability assessment phase, which is where we combine the projections with indicators. So again, remember we have business lines, flood risk management, navigation, recreation, hydropower. They all have different indicators of what would uh, the changes do to that project. So combining the projections and the indicators into a vulnerability score, teams can say, 
hey, even though I can't predict the future, there does seem to be some evidence here, multiple lines of evidence that indicate a potential vulnerability for this project in this particular way. And for that reason, we are gonna recommend XYZ. We're gonna recommend armoring this levee. So if it does overtop, it doesn't wash away. Or we're gonna recommend adding some green space to store um, overwash if, if water does have to come into this area. So again, different from sea level, because with sea level, we are requiring our teams to plan for the future conditions. With riverine, we feel like we just can't forecast in that kind of way. What we're doing is uh, more of a qualitative assessment. But qualitative data is data, obviously, and people can make recommendations based on that kind of information. So we've made a number of these web tools, and this has been uh, quite a success story for us. You know, most of our engineers and scientists are not climate scientists and don't want to be climate scientists. So we haven't, we're not just going to write a manual that says you must be a climate scientist. We, we make these web tools to make the analyses uh, faster, cheaper, more repeatable. Um, when the engineer does the analysis and then the technical reviewer comes after them to check it, they can use the same tool and see if they get the same answer. So these are all examples of some of the tools we've created. So upper left, we've got the, the sea level tracker I already showed you. Um, the center top there is our time series toolbox with the statistical tests of changes. The um, upper right is an example from one of our literature review summaries. The lower left is our vulnerability assessment tool and the lower center is the climate hydrology tool. Um, so this has been something that has really saved people a lot of headache and a lot of training. Um, we have climate literacy as one of our objectives of the, of the climate action plan, but we don't want to spend all of our time training people. Um, they do have to know other things as well. So we've made these tools uh, that are mostly online web-based tools. We've also got guidance. And again, like I said, none of this stuff is top secret. So everyone is welcome to read our guidance, copy it, um, take a piece, uh, use it. Actually, a lot of state agencies find a lot of use from this, so they will take our guidance documents and copy verbatim some, some paragraphs um, and use it for their own. So we have a publications web page. You can easily find it by Googling. But here's just a few examples of some engineering regulations, pamphlets, uh, circulars, construction bulletins um, that people have, that we've made, made available so people, uh, for our own teams, it's required, but for anyone else who wants to read it, you're welcome to. Um, and this basically tells people what they must do and how they must do it. So an engineering regulation says, thou shalt consider sea level rise. And then the uh, engineering pamphlet would say how to consider sea level rise. So the regulation might be five pages and the, the pamphlet might be a 200 page pamphlet, but it's all online anyway. So hopefully you're not printing it. That would not be sustainable. <laughs> So I'm, I'm concluding here um, right on time, and my concluding statements, if you don't take anything from my talk, I just hope that you would take these uh, five statements with you. But one thing, first of all, is climate change is happening now. It's already affecting Corps of Engineer projects. Um, it's going to continue, and it's going to continue no matter what we do on the emissions side. That being said, we need to quit carbon as soon as we can. But even if we did, we would still have climate change for thousands of years, and we need to get ready. That's why climate mitigation and adaptation are both critical, and we need science uh, on both sides. So thank you both. Thank you for very much on both of those. Um, we have a policy that requires that climate change has to be considered in planning, and actually in planning, design, operations, maintenance, uh, rehab, and, and divestment, as I said. And although we have, uh, we're lacking in that crystal ball, we don't have the ability to make a accurate precise forecast in most cases. That doesn't mean that we can't do anything. And we do have a framework that allows teams to make recommendations and make investment decisions, despite the fact that they don't have a, a prediction of the, of the future. Um, that being said, I'm very interested in trying to get to that prediction, um, if we can get there. And then finally, our guidance documents and our online web-based tools, most of which are publicly available, are how we translate that climate science into action. So as the science advances, as the sort of bleeding edge of science becomes actionable science, we take the actionable science, we pilot it, we test it, and then we eventually work it into our guidance, our, our tools, and then our teams are gonna use those in feasibility studies and eventually into um, a dam or a levee or um, a navigation channel near you. So, those are my, uh, my slides. I do have some supplementary materials so we can play backup slide roulette if you like. 
but I think I've got about um, 14 minutes remaining. I would be thrilled to take any questions you have. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my question is about sort of the federal government overall. Mm -hmm. And if any of your information, like FEMA has to, you know, they, they consider what you've done when they go in and fix a disaster and then how the money they give to like, what do we have to repair and replace has to somehow align with your studies. If there's anything like that that's done in the federal government. Yes, great question. And I think the simplest answer is we sure try our best. So we have a lot of interagency working groups that are mostly convened by the White House, uh, OMB and CEQ, that are intended to make us work better together. And we also organically do those things too, through the auspices of things like the USGCRP. Um, we, we get ourselves together and we make sure that we're collaborating across the federal space, also with academia, international partners, NGOs, uh, state, local and state agencies. So we really do work very hard to try to collaborate. The, the worst thing is when you learn from your own mistakes when you could have learned from someone else's lessons learned. You know? So um, that collaboration is something that we always put a high uh, emphasis on. There are sometimes constraints. Uh, other agencies do have their mandates and, and their policies that are sometimes imposed or sometimes uh, organically generated within. So, you know, if FEMA is going to make a map, you know, they may or may not be constrained by policy or interpretation of policy of whether that map can be only based on observed data or whether it can also be based on projections. So we can collaborate in terms of understanding each other. We might not always be able to collaborate or align when it comes to the actual products. I think what we, what we all recognize is that there is such a thing as authoritative data and authoritative scientific facts. But when it comes to methods and approaches, it's really about fitness for purpose. And so a different agency that has a different mandate may very well have a different uh, fitness for purpose, you know, based on what they're trying to do. So as an implementer of infrastructure, we really can't hedge too far either way. We can't assume the best case or assume the worst case. If we assume the best and it turns out to be worse, we've just delivered you a project that's going to uh, underperform. You know, but if we do it the other way, we've given you a white elephant, and now you're waiting 200 years for the climate to change you know, before it really does what it's supposed to do. So um, there are going to be times when other people may want to assume only the highest emission scenarios and throw out all the positive effects and only consider the negative effects. Maybe that's fine for them. We're still going to try to understand each other. We might not be able to have exactly the same uh, outputs but we, we try our best. And I realize this is a source of frustration for a lot of people in the public. You know, they say, why can't you all just get together and all do the same thing all the time? And I say, look, wouldn't it be convenient if everybody all drove the same car? You know, that would be so much more efficient. That would be so much easier in so many ways. But there are reasons why different people are driving different cars. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm just uh, interested in understanding the, um, the level of cooperation you get at the national level, because mm -hmm. uh, you're working with all the states in implementing your, your programs. And I'm just wondering how much cooperation you get uh, from the different states, uh, working with uh, different competing interests that you, you may get from, let's say, the governor's office or the, uh, at the city level. Uh, you know, just as an example, uh, I live in Miami, yep. and there's just a, a lot of things going on that seems to be inconsistent with uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Like we're going through a whole construction evolution now, and it just seems like all, all this construction right on the, uh, on the waterways doesn't make much sense. You know, and also, also the, uh, the competing interests with developers trying to further develop out into the Everglades. Right. So I'm just wondering how you you deal, how you manage that? Yeah, it depends a lot on the state. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, whenever I would go to a meeting, there would at least be one person who would try to argue whether or not climate change was real. Um, I'd never really see that anymore. Now I see people saying, why can't you do more? Why can't you just uh, project more accurately? You know, why can't you assume or project future conditions more aggressively? Um, 
And so, you know, especially states like California, New York, New Jersey, um, they have their own projections of climate change or sea level rise, and, and they would like us to use theirs. And in many cases, theirs are more conservative. You know, they may have priorities that come down to things like zoning and building codes that are, um, I would say, asymmetrical in terms of the, the risk of type 1 and type 2 error there. So the pressure, I think, has shifted from, from why are you doing so much to why aren't you doing more. Um, Florida is interesting. South Carolina is interesting. You know, the political winds can shift very quickly. And what might have been a priority under one administration can change uh, 180 degrees sometimes. And then you have states that are just not very uh, well resourced, you know, Mississippi or Arkansas, you know, they just don't have the, the offices set up in some cases for some of these things. So it depends, depends quite a lot on the state. Um, looking at Miami and Florida in particular, I'm very interested in this idea of what people are really going to do in the future. You know, when we plan projects, we make assumptions about future population growth and, and patterns of that growth. And so far, people have not reacted as uh, spherical, frictionless, Econ 101 uh, rational actors. You know, they haven't started leaving Miami or Virginia Beach, uh, much the opposite. You know, the, the boom is ongoing. And so when we plan a project in Miami, what should we be assuming people are going to do in the future? It's very interesting. And I think that the projections that we come up with and the projections the state or the, the city, you know, the mayor's office might come up with probably going to be very different. So I guess it's just a long-winded way of saying it depends, um, which is sort of the only question ever. That, that's the answer to every hydrology question is it depends. Um, but um, yeah, it depends a lot on the state. And, and we do put a lot of emphasis on shared vision planning and, and getting consensus in our project planning because we do rely on those non-federal interests typically to pay 35% cost share of the project. So if the city of Miami is not on board with our plan, then there's no plan. Um, so we have to have a shared vision uh, to move forward. I think, yeah, there's a microphone coming around, I think, for the people who are online. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, coming from Michigan, then, I would okay. ask um, yeah. if you have a educated guess about what will happen to the Great Lakes by 2021? Uh, the great, so the Great Lakes is something we've been trying to get some guidance on as an analogous thing to sea level rise for, for lake level change. Um, obviously there the consensus is not unidirectional. You know, it could go up, it could go down. Um, it seems like as we have more ice-free time, the evaporation off the lake surface is going up. Um, at the same time, it seems like as the winters are relatively warmer, it's not warm in Michigan in the wintertime, but it's relatively less cold, it seems like there's actually more snow and as a result more, more runoff in the spring maybe. So that's, it's tough. Uh, we're trying to get, uh, we actually have a team working on that uh, out of the Detroit district that's trying to come up with some projections of future lake levels, um, but it's pretty complicated. Also the, the upper uh, Midwest is an area that is particularly sensitive to these long-term climate cycles. So as a statistical challenge, it's very hard to tell a, a permanent breakpoint from a, a long-term cycle. Um, so the USGS uh, has done a number of studies on that, and um, it, it's, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I realize that's a non-answer, but um, I think uh, all I can say is we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so one of the items that you had discussed is um, decision points. Sometimes yeah. within a project, um, there's a variance and uncertainty, and yeah. so um, the project may, may take an approach where, hey, if we hit a marker X amount of years down the line, we'll take action. Right. I was just um, curious to understand what are the processes within the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to monitor that, and because you know that could be 20 years down the line. You know, mm -hmm. we all know how those things can. You know, you might have a great idea right now, but they get lost in translation. Is is there a um, is there an individual that's actually monitoring this, and how does that get implemented? How does it get funded? Is that yeah, yeah? So it it depends basically on whether or not it's a beach, and this goes back to authorities and congressional um, legislation and, and the way projects are authorized. Beaches are a special kind of project because they have to be renourished over time. You don't know when the storm is gonna come, but when it does, it's gonna erode a bunch of sand off that beach and you're gonna to need to come back and add more sand. So when you're planning over a 50 year economic analysis horizon, for example, you might figure on three or four or five nourishment cycles. You don't know when they're gonna happen, but you assume 
at some point, you're going to have to come back and place more sand. And so because of that reason, Congress has authorized beaches to be able to use continuing construction funds to do those, those nourishments. So if a project is a beach, or if it's beachy enough um, to get through our Office of Water Project Review and, and White House <laughs> OMB, then it can leverage those continuing construction dollars. So for example, in New York City, there's the Jamaica Bay to Far Rockaway project that's a composite seawall. So it's a combination of a, a rock wall inside of a beach and dune. So it's a nature-based feature on top of a structural feature. Um, that was found to be beachy enough uh, to pass, pass muster and be allowed to use that mechanism. So when the future um, sea level rises to the trigger point over a certain averaging period, sorry, um, then the, the next layer of sand will be added, the height of the rock wall will be added, um, access ramps and stairs and things will be modified. And that can all use continuing construction funds. Now, the question of who does the monitoring, um, usually that's going to be the sponsor who's going to reach out when that happens. Um, it could be a local uh, tide gauge that's being used. It could be a USGS or NOAA gauge. So if I could emphasize one thing, please do not eliminate ga gauges. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, saving $5,000 a year in maintenance is not worth throwing away 100 years of record. Um, that drives me absolutely crazy. So support your local USGS if you have any influence there. You know, support NOAA. They, these agencies really need those resources and, and state agencies as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's probably going to be the local interest that's going to be doing the monitoring and then raising the issue, and then we're going to go and, and do that modification. If it's not a beach, then we don't have that same flexibility to use continuing construction dollars. What we do in that case is we do a general reevaluation re report. So what, we, what happens is the changing conditions trigger another study. And then we study whether there's a federal interest to modify the project. Now, probably there is. Uh, if we set it up to be adaptable in the first place, then it's pretty low cost, pretty high benefit um, to, to do that adaptation step. But it does have to be studied over again, and that's just because of the way the, the projects are, are authorized. So, yeah. Yeah, I had a question. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think your, your statement about more science is leading to more uncertainty is very profound. I'm going to yeah, about more apparent little, uncertainty. Yeah. More apparent. Yeah, yeah right. Um, but I'm wondering, does the Army Corps um, so on the topic of science, yes. does the Army Corps, have you identified missing science or directions that need to be increased or improved and does the Army Corps have the capability yes. to, to direct or yes. initiate science? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So again, we're not a science agency, we're not really grant making, we don't go out with millions and millions of dollars and, and do basic science research. You know, that's what Richard does, I think. But, um, you know, when we identify a particular knowledge gap where we need to, we need to close this gap to do something in, in particular that's going to benefit our projects, then yes, we do have some ability to do very focused research activities. And we will go to national labs or universities and come with a few hundred thousand dollars maybe for a couple of years and do a very focused project with a specific outcome. And a lot of times our academic partners really enjoy these because they have you know, fixed deadlines and at the end of the day they get their name on a report or a new tool or something like that. And, um, and it's, it's pretty constrained, you know. So we can do that. Uh, so I'm down to my last 20 seconds, but you know, as an example, compound flooding, uh, you've got sea level rise, you've got coastal floods, you've got river floods. We needed a new tool and method to basically take the, the load off of our uh, coastal engineers to um, analyze that without having to know anything about copulas and uh, and be programmers. And so we went to uh, Central Florida, University, University of Central Florida, and, and worked with someone to basically get that built out. So it has to be a fairly narrow project need. We're a project-funded agency. Um, but in those cases, yes, we do have the ability to spend a little bit of money. Nothing like a, a telescope in the Atacama Desert, though, unfortunately. I think I'm out of time here, but um, I would be happy to take to talk to any of you uh, over lunch. Um, and once again, just uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, thanks to Richard for the invitation. So.